thanks everyone for joining us. Um, really excited about this talk. Should be a you know, fantastic insight into the magazine industry. Um, so we've got three panellists here um, who I will ask in a minute for them to introduce themselves. Um, this is going to be very informal as it can be virtually, but if you have got questions, and I know students are well used to using this by now, you can put them in the in the chat function. Um, and obviously we will give you the opportunity to actually ask your questions if you prefer. So you, you're, you're muted at the moment, but you can obviously um, unmute yourself and ask questions because we want this to be um, as relevant to you as possible. But so we've got two students here, Wisdom and Jessica, who some of you may recognise. They've been forced to put their cameras on because <laughs> they've got very important role and that they've come up with um, questions. So they're going to be our interviewers today, um, asking the panellists um, questions. So I'm sure they've come up with a lot of things that you would have asked, or you might have other questions that you want to ask. So before we get, ask Wisdom and Jessica to take over, um, it would be really nice if I could just get the panel to introduce themselves just to the students that are here. So, um, Joy, do you want to go first? <laughs> oh, God, I did it. I started it away. <laughs> <laughs> um, my name is Joy, and I'm the social media and content manager at Men Health Magazine, which is a health and fitness magazine for men. Cool. Finley? <laughs> Uh, I'll do the work as well. Solidarity. <laughs> uh, hi everyone, my name is Finley and I'm the Deputy Style Editor at Esquire, uh, which is a men's luxury lifestyle magazine. I believe is how we market it. <laughs> cool. Uh, Jessica? <laughs> Hello. I mean, I've joined the bandwagon for the wave. Um, <laughs> I'm Jessica, I'm the art editor on Cosmopolitan magazine, which is currently the number one young women's magazine in the UK. Excellent. So hopefully the students here have all heard, I'm sure you have all heard of those those magazines that um, we're mentioning. And we're saying about the wave because I was saying my children keep telling me off, telling me off for doing the wave on camera because it looks really silly. So I'm not going to do it anymore. Well, we've all done it. We've all done it. <laughs> we've all done it. So, yeah, so this is going to be, you know, do put your questions in the chat, but we're going to kick off. I think we'd like, um, so Wisdom, do you want to kick off with um, your first questions? You unmute yourself. <laughs> Every time. Okay. Right, there we go. I think, there we go. Um, great, so um, I first want to know what made you want to go into the magazine industry? This can be for any of you, by the way. Um, I've always been fascinated by it. And when I was, oh my goodness, I'm going to sound really old now. When I was your age, <laughs> um, I had a careers advisor who said, well, you've got this interest in English and you've got an interest in fashion, why not consider going into like fashion journalism? And I was like, oh, okay. Didn't realize that was a thing. And then gradually studied media studies, business studies at college and went on to study journalism at university. And it was just a thing that I enjoyed. I always bought magazines when I went to the supermarket. So I sort of knew that that's an industry that I wanted to be in, if that makes any sense. Mm. Great. Does anyone else want to chip in with that one? Uh, yeah, I'll go so I don't interrupt anyone. Uh, I I didn't really know at all until I was about 22, so probably like older than you guys now, but I was working in like a hotel and in a restaurant and stuff and didn't really think it was like something. I didn't go to university either. Uh, and then I did a, a what's called an NCTJ, which is like a national certification of trained journalists, I believe it's called. So it's like a short course at a newspaper where you kind of learn the ropes about writing and journalism and stuff. And then I managed to get in a bit of work experience at Esquire when I was about, I just turned 23. So I guess like compared to yeah. you guys, I was a little bit older, but uh and it just kind of went from there. So I didn't really like have an ambition to do it when I was younger, but it just sort of fell into place. Yeah. But, so I think that's more than one way for sure. Same question. Jessica? 
Oh, sorry, it it keeps breaking up and I couldn't hear properly. Um, mine's quite cliche, really. Uh, I loved magazines from like really young age. I had a subscription to everything going, like Ms. Bliss, Cosmo <laughs> Vogue, like really into the fashion, beauty, and celebs. I just wanted the magazine lifestyle. Um, Love the hill, sex in the city, all of that. But I had no idea really how to do it. Um, so I knew, I loved writing, but I knew my passion was more about design. And I didn't even know if that was a job in magazines. But I kept taking design at every opportunity I could and kept making all my teacher. I kept being like, is there anything I can do to make this more like a magazine? Can I do a magazine thing? And I just kept doing that at every stage throughout <laughs> like GCSE, uh, A-level and then uni till eventually I got to the point where I could go and do work experience in it but that's how I got into it really, very cliche. <laughs> Just keep going through your questions with Great. No. <laughs> I'm sick, sorry. Um, no, I know. Um, what do you think kind of is the future for magazines? Um, again, any of you can Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, I work in digital and I started off in print and obviously I trained to be a print journalist and fell into digital just because I enjoyed coding, I enjoyed social media and that kind of thing. So I feel like the future is on that side where you read everything online and you sort of, everything's on your phone and on the go and fast paced. So in my, in my opinion, that's where the future lies. The print side is sort of going to die down a bit. But there are people who sort of enjoy buying it and flicking through pages and having that yeah. in their hands. So there, there will still be an element of it, but the majority would end up being more digital. Great. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I think. Should I? Oh, that's. <laughs> 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 no, it's always that. <laughs> Yeah, I agree, I agree with Joy. I think that there are people still like kind of, kind of like Joy said, like buying, some people like buying magazines. I think they'll become like, maybe like back in the day, you'd have had like 50 people working on a magazine. I think it would be like smaller teams, but you'll have to be able to do like multiple things at once. So you'll be, have to be able to work online, work on print, but, but have your kind of, have your interest in a few different areas. Mm. I think like, there used to be a thing where you could be really specific. You could be like, I'm just a film journalist or I'm just a fashion journalist. And now I think you have to kind of be into lots of different things. You have to be quite adaptable, yeah. but yeah. Great. Yeah, I think I'm still quite biased. I think that people will want to buy physical <laughs> products of a magazine. Like, I will. Um, But I also think that magazine brands will become more and more influential online. And yeah, I think mm. the like the really big brands will be able to keep their products, maybe not monthly, maybe in my head, maybe like biannually or something like that. But to me, there'll always be a product for the big names, I hope, <laughs> anyway. Mm. And then yeah, it'll be a mixture of being able to do everything and work across all different platforms. Yeah, right. Um... I guess what's kind of one thing you wish you'd known when you were starting out your career? Like if you could go back and tell yourself something, what would it be? For me, it would be the fact that I went to uni. I feel like I've met so many people in the industry who didn't go to uni and like, oh, just, yeah, intern and I became an apprentice here and then I got into in the industry. And I was like, I spent three years. I paid so much money just to <laughs> learn something that you've learned by just being an apprentice and shadowing someone. So yeah, I feel like that's something I wish I knew that I didn't have to do, but I am glad I went, but if I see a young person, if you're, stu if you're not studying law or some sort of medicine related course, mm -hmm. I wouldn't sort of advise, oh, go to uni and learn this. Yes, you get the experience, but you get more tangible experience by going into the path yeah. of apprenticeships and stuff, so yeah. Uh, I go? I'll go next as well. We'll go. I like the way it's going. Yeah, it's a nice rhythm to it. Uh, <laughs> I think that I think it's a good thing to learn early on, and it does take it takes a little bit of time, but to kind of not be too scared of rejection. A lot of the time is 
I think a lot of like media or like journalism is you're going to send out emails and you're not going to hear anything back at, or you'll hear a no. And I think that it's good to kind of build up a bit of resilience to that quite early on where you're like, I got my work experience and internship at Esquire just by finding an email address on Google and just sending an email being like, can I just come in and kind of just see how it all works? And mm -hmm. I emailed DQ and didn't hear back. I emailed like a few newspapers, didn't hear back, but Esquire came back to me and kind of that's sort of how it started. So I think if you don't, it's, it's, I think it's important to not feel like too disheartened because there's a lot of like rejection, but sometimes it is as simple as just sort of sending an email or just asking a question. Yeah. Good to know. Um, I don't know if I'm technically allowed to say this, hopefully I am. <laughs> <laughs> no, I wish I would have known that the money isn't what you'd imagine, but, <laughs> but it is <laughs> well, maybe it's wrapped up in a very like glitz and glam, like, oh my god, you're gonna be absolutely raking it in like more than a banker. But I think what you do have is job satisfaction and that's really really important like I think in our industry it's a job that you really love and my friend always says to me like they do a job you love and you'll never work a day in your life kind of thing so it's about the balance but yeah I think <laughs> it'd have been good to know but you can work your way up as well um it just takes time <laughs> <laughs> Can't hear you. Oh, me? Yeah. <laughs> oh my yeah. god. Sick, right, sorry. Oh, there we go. It got me cut out for a bit and then I had to leave. But um yeah, I kinda caught the end of that, but it sounded good. So um <laughs> <laughs> I guess I would wanna ask like what's kind of what's something you've worked on that you're like most proud of? It's a tough one. Um, the most recent one I would say, um, working at Men's Health, we've got, um, last year in May, we had a cover where we went to a secondary school in South London and we basically took pictures of some, some of the students and they ended up on the magazine cover and they were basically talking about mental health, which is a topic that is rarely openly talked about, especially in young people especially in young black boys. So that I feel like was an achievement to be able to get them to be open about how they're feeling and their emotions and then have them on the front cover of the magazine. And yeah, I think that's my so far proudest moment. Yeah. yeah. That's true. I don't, m mine's not as, uh, mine's more <laughs> selfish than Joy's. <laughs> I, can't, I can't beat that, I can't top that one. Uh, I think, I think it's always like the first time you see your name on printed in the magazine, that's always like, that's a, pretty, that's a nice moment. Uh, and last year as well, I started taking pictures for the magazine last year as well. So seeing my name for the photos and for writing was, is good, which I guess ties into, yeah, if you can try and like build up a skill set so you're doing more than one thing, mm. I'd always recommend it. But yeah, that was, that was quite a nice moment. Um. I think for me, we get to do like lots of different special projects with Cosmo. And last year we got to do a sex education initiative, which was like a groundbreaking educational program for year 10 to 11 students um, across the country. And I was basically the lead designer of like this curriculum booklet that we got to do and take it into schools and it was just so amazing to be a part of and we got to actually visit all the schools and watch it being taught and watch your mini textbook get used in classes and that was just really cool and for me it it led to me winning an award last year the ppa for 13 to 30 and that was just like oh the best thing for me <laughs> Ever. So, yeah, I love that. <laughs> it was cool that it was something Great. different and not just about the magazine. It was like taking the magazine to education. Yeah, fantastic. Right, well, um, what's the best piece of advice you've ever heard? And it doesn't just have to be like to do with magazines. It could just be in general, or it could be through your work. So, could you repeat the question? 
What's the best piece of advice you've like ever heard? Like, and it doesn't just have to be with magazines. Don't be a statistic. It sounds That's weird. Cool. Every every time I got settled and I'm like, oh, I don't want to do this. I remember that, and that um, a teacher told me this when I was 15. She's like, don't be a statistic. You're black. You're this. You are expected to be a certain way. Don't end up how they expect you to be everywhere in yeah. every environment I'm in. That was one thing that I, it just kept keeps on playing in my mind. Don't be a statistic, don't be a statistic. Always break the mold and break the odds. So that's my best advice. Yeah. yeah. Great. Uh, so I guess for me, I got this actually from one of my colleagues a couple of years ago, who's a bit older, he's probably like in his forties, but I think it's definitely a job that you can compare yourself to people all the time you can get yourself kind of stressed out you're like you look and go this person's written that i wish i'd written that that person's done this i wish i'd done that and i definitely know people that can make you a bit like maybe insecure or like a bit bitter and you're always like saying i deserve this i should have that and i think he just it sounds like ridiculously simple but it's just like chill it's fine and it's mm. just being a, a level of perspective that it takes a little bit of time everyone goes in their own sort of pace so I think yeah. it's important, I guess it ties into like social media, all that stuff, just like sort of have a have that kind of grounding and perspective that you're doing your own thing and yeah. working towards something, but you're not always like stressed about what all, everyone else is doing and, and achieving because you can't control any of that stuff. Um, my old editor always told us and everyone to step outside of your comfort zone and that to me always reminds me that even if it terrifies me or makes me nervous or uncomfortable or whatever it's just take a leap of faith and the payoff can be so great and you're so proud of yourself at the end for what you do even though you don't necessarily love it in the moment and it's uncomfortable but the end goal is so worth it so I always try and keep that in mind if I'm worried about anything great um what is your favourite and least favourite part of your job? My favourite <laughs> is that um, it's fast paced, no two days the same. So you go in and you're like, oh, I wonder what it's going to throw at me today. And you look forward to that and it's just not the same. My least favourite part is there's no switch off. It's because mm. I work in social media. So when my colleagues are like, bye, see you, see you on Monday. I still got work to do on Saturday and Sunday. So it's just like... There's no switching off and saying my weekend is my weekend and I'm not going to think about work. It's just, it's a constant thing. So that's the part I personally don't like about my job. <laughs> uh, I'd say favourite for me is, well, before all of this happened, um, there was that opportunity where you could, kind of like Joy said, you could just do a lot of different things at once. Like I could go from a meeting with a brand and then you're writing a story and then you might have a thing in the evening where you're like socializing and you get some good travel as well. Like get to go to Paris and Italy a few times a year. And just, there are times when you're like, wow, this is like, this, this is, is nice. This is nice. This is a yeah. good life for sure. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and it makes all the other like stress and stuff worth it. But, and I'd say least favorite emails. Um, <laughs> yeah. They're necessary. It's a necessary evil, but I do feel slightly envious of like maybe people 30, 40 years ago, pre-email, must have been quite nice. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think for me, again, pre-lockdown, um, my favourite would be attending our cover shoots. Like, it's even six years on, it's still a pinch me moment. Like, am I actually having a bagel with this celebrity or whatever? Like, it's, <laughs> it's so fun. Like, it's still like, is this my life? Um, <laughs> Um, my least favourite would be all the little admin bits, the non-glamorous bits, like filling in image rights on our software and all little things like that. And then at the end of the month as well, we have to do final checks on all, all our layouts. And oh, that's just hectic press week. And you have to have the eye of a hawk to make sure no mistakes go through and get printed. So that would be my... <laughs> um... What's one thing that you think your magazine should be championing, maybe like in the next year or so? Oh, because I, I, I work 
for a men's magazine, so I don't feel like I can relate to a lot of the content. So most of the time, I'm just like, nah, nah. Um, but <laughs> this whole Black Lives Matter movement, our editor in chief, who basically looks after the whole magazine, whether it's digital or print, he basically made a pledge to sort of increase the diversity in the magazine pages, whether it's working with more um, people of color or whether it's just working with like brands who champion people of color, that kind of thing. So that's one thing that I've always wanted to see in magazines. So to be able to have this movement happen and then for the movement to be able to take the conversation where I'm now seeing something that I wanted to see in my magazine happen is kind of nice. Yeah. I'd, I'd like to say, I guess, like, our magazine, it's about, like, expensive clothes and lots of that stuff. But I think I'd like to see it more accessible to to people to kind of get into that world. Because, like, I didn't come from a background of it or, like, have go to university. And I think it can be hard for people because they look at magazine like, how do I get to do that? Or, like, how is that for me? And I think that I'd like us to have more programs like scholarships or internships and stuff where we could get people in to show them that. It's a, well, it's, it is, there's definitely like a place for everyone to do it. And you don't have to be like yeah. from Oxford or Cambridge or any of this sort of stuff to like get into the world of journalism. And that, that there's, and there's so many different branches you can get into, but it can be intimidating to like get that first foot on the ladder. Um, so I'd like to yeah. see it made a bit easier for that first, that first step. Yeah. I think for us at Cosmo, I just want to see even more diversity in all matters of the word so whether it's like skin color gender shape size everything um we we our next cover star is going to be bame and we previously had non-binary jonathan van ness and pansexual christine from christine and the queens and we had a plus size model test holiday who created loads of controversy by being on our cover which was great for us and it really opened up um discussions about body image and piers morgan threw loads of hate and critique at us at the time but <laughs> the public did not agree and it sold really well so i want to do more of that to the point of where it doesn't become shocking anymore where it's just yeah. normal to have everybody on and represented great those are already good answers. Those are all my questions done. So, yeah. Wow. But thank you. Thanks. Thank, thank, thank you. you. <laughs> so now, Jessica, it's it's your turn. Do you want to start working through your questions? Um, so this kind of links to what Jessica was just talking about. But um, how diverse do you think the industry is right now? Do you mean on the magazine or in the office? Or both? Um, both. Not very diverse, but there, there has been improvements, but I feel like there's so much work that needs to be done and there has to be the acknowledgement that there are people who don't feel represented. Like for years, like Jessica, I used to buy magazines, I used to obsess over them, I've got piles of them, and I just never saw myself on those pages, but I still wanted to work in the industry. And more often than not, I would walk into the office and I'm the only person of color. And it's always like, oh, you feel, you, you feel different. You feel like the other, but it's a change that I'm hoping as we go on and more people, more young people want to work in the industry and people like us, me, Finley and Jessica can actually champion people and bring them in as well. So the change is coming, but right now I would say it's not very balanced. Yeah, I, I agree. I agree with Joyce for sure. I think that like, there's loads of work to be done. And I just think traditionally it's always been like uh, an elitist industry or like something that you have to be kind of part of the club or go to the right uni or like. And I think. As kind of Joyce said before about like the whole university conversation, it's great if you want to go. But I think it's important that with journalism, all these things, these are like skills that you can develop. Your, not yourself, but like through good guidance. But you don't need to be you don't have to have a certain degree or anything like that. So I'd, I'd love it with Hearst or like Esquire that we could, like I kind of said before, it creates, that we could create more channels to kind of get people in. Because if people have the talent, then I think the jobs are there. It's just getting people in the door, which I think is important for us to, again, make it easy because it can be really intimidating. I can totally understand that. 
Yeah, and sim similar really. It's definitely we've got a long way to go before we are fully diverse and everything. For us at Cosmo, um, Amy, our executive editor, last year, me specifically recruited BAME writers and designers for work experience and internship, which I think was a really great thing. And from all over the country as well, like from people up north and Scotland, well, it's like all over because it's quite a London thing. I feel like the industry at the moment, and it's just about branching out and getting people from all over and all different backgrounds to build it to be more diverse. Um, following on from that question, how do you think that people from more diverse backgrounds can be encouraged to pursue these careers if they aren't right now? Sorry, what was the question? So following on from the last question, how do you think people from more diverse backgrounds could be encouraged to pursue these kinds of careers? Um, with opportunities like what? Jess has spoken about and with things like this that we're doing where we're talking to you directly and telling you this is the opportunity so if you wake up one day like oh actually I want to pursue a career in that industry I remember I spoke to Joy, Jessica and Finley I'm going to send them an email just to reintroduce myself that kind of so it's about I feel like our industry is mainly about who you know and sometimes when you're in um, a less privileged background you don't know who you don't know much people so you have to really reach out and market yourself and network as much as possible yeah no i, I tell you i totally agree with joe i think it would be nice yeah if we could have like more outreach more more outreach programs more kind of specific internships that kind of target maybe like kids who feel like they're, they're again like journalism or that kind of thing isn't for them uh I'd also recommend if you're into writing, and this kind of, I think, goes back to something that I said before, is I guess maybe like build a bit of a profile now. You know, you can set up a medium for free. You can set up a WordPress. I got my first internship by, I just had like a little blog on the side and no one read it, but it just, <laughs> just showed. <laughs> yeah, no. But it was just a thing that I could send out and be like, look, I say I'm into writing. Here's something I've written. And that was just that first step. So I'd say if you're like on the fence, definitely just get something down and then it just it does become easier from there. Um, yeah, similar thing to the guys. I think it's also about like following the right people from the magazines that you're interested in, if that's where you want to go, because you can keep in contact with them, keep in contact with the brand. Um, if you're interested in design, I would suggest any designy bits of work that you've got now, put them together on either a website or even on an Instagram. If you don't want to do a website, have an Instagram account purely for your design work. And then you can send that to the relevant people of your magazines that you want to be involved with. And it just shows that you're really keen. It shows everything that you've got on your potential. And yeah, like what we're doing here, the best way is through networking and getting to know the people who you know is definitely key. <laughs> everyone knows everyone in this industry I feel like so yeah. it's always going to be like a route in if you know one of us um, how important is creativity in the roles that you have um, like for me as a social media manager I'm handling pictures I'm handling words, videos so I feel like there's a certain level of creativity that I'm required to have just to be able to survive. You have to have an eye for viral content. You're going to see something, you'll be like, yeah, the audience is really going to love this. They're going to eat it up and like it and share it and all of that. So in terms of creativity, just know what would work for your brand and then taking it on. I'm not designing in content, but I'm able to inform on the process and be like, oh, I saw this or this magazine or this company did this. I think our audience would enjoy this as well. Let's post about this thing. So in terms of creativity, I think there's different types of creativity that is required. But like we said earlier, um, you have to be a master of so many different things. So creativity is just one aspect of it, but you also have to have an eye for a good story and that kind of stuff. Uh, yeah, I guess following on from Joy, I'd say I'd say it's really important. But almost I find that what's be, what's been more important for me, I've been at Esquire for five years now, and what's been more important is 
be becoming good at taking on constructive criticism because I'll sit down even now I've been there for five years and I know my editor really well and I'll sit down with 20 ideas for a story and he'll say no to 17 of them <laughs> and it's like and there are times when I'm like oh, I really wanted to do that one but okay fine and I think it's just being good at being able to move past because it hurts you know it's definitely like there's we all have egos and stuff and you're like oh, I could do this and you sit down and he says no and you go okay fine let's focus on the three that he said yes to that's the positive and I think that that's been a really good lesson is being able to not not kind of get in a mood or not get down it's like be able to stay upbeat and also surround yourself with people who want to see you improve as well I think if you get into a good magazine that you like you'll have lots of people that want to work with you and push you forward so I think it's being creative but it's having a lot of ideas and being able to move past rejection is a good skill to have yeah I think for me as art editor like creativity is pretty much my entire role so like for us we are, I love the process from start to finish of thinking of an idea um to produce an original image of that which will be really good for our demographic that they'll relate to that's poppy and punchy and fun whether it's going on a shoot with props uh styling things I love doing stuff like that or a bit of illustration on my iPad like all the really hands-on creative stuff absolutely love and um for my team they always make sure that if they've had an idea they get to see it from start to finish and make it their whole project so it's not being passed around everyone and you really get to be extra proud of a piece of creativity that you've done uh so yeah it's it's everything in my role i think um, this question is more for jessica and joy but um what's it been like to be a woman in this industry Um, <laughs> with the role that I'm in right now, I'm one of two women on the team. Yeah, oh my goodness. And it's it's a bit weird because you're sitting at meeting and you're surrounded you're surrounded by men. And you're like, oh, okay. And obviously they're very big and macho, and their voice are louder than yours. So it's quite intimidating when you first start because you're like, I'm just going to keep my ideas to myself because I'm not here to. I, you can't speak loud enough for them to actually hear you but as time went on and I sort of gauged their different personalities I sort of know how to word my ideas how to wrap it up so that person can be like oh okay I see where you're coming from so it can be intimidating but that's just because I work for a men's magazine maybe if I worked on Cosmo it might be more women than men and then I'll be able to um to relate to them a bit more. So I think it just depends on which publication you're with. Yeah, I think, I mean, for me, it's completely the opposite to Joy. Oh, so is it all breaking up? I can no. hear me still. <laughs> um, yeah, we only have one man on Cosmo, who's the creative director. He's like the dad of Cosmo. Um, everybody else is a woman and the magazines I've worked on I worked for Glamour that was heavily women and there's so many female editors of women's magazine and women's in position of work which is really inspiring for me for like personal career progression and just I feel like in our magazine we all really support each other and lift each other up because we're just a big group of women and that's what we all do like <laughs> <laughs> it's very different I think the between your brands how they're reflected thank you um what does the average working day entail for you or is there no average day um there's no average day <laughs> I could come in today and be like oh I'm going to schedule content and then I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that and then boom there's a comment on social media that needs to be handled. And then that has to go through different processes. Like, oh, what should we say to this random guy who's trolling us? And so there's no, there's no two days the same, especially since coronavirus happened and working from home. It's been sort of hard to be like, oh, this is going to be a quiet day and this is going to be a busy day. Like every day is just the same. It's just, you just keep on rolling. And I think that personally what I enjoy the most about my job is knowing that I could come in and there's a fire and I have to put that fire out. 
rather than come in and just be like, uh, I would hate that. <laughs> uh, yeah, so it's, I guess it, it's been a bit more predictable because of coronavirus that like we've been working from home for the last nearly three months. So we've been making like the physical magazine, but all remotely. So it's been a lot of Zoom meetings, a lot of phone calls, messaging, stuff like that. But normally it would be like a mixture of meeting brands or clients. Because a big thing that I didn't realise before I got into working magazines, so much of it is working with advertisers. Basically, advertisers are the ones that pay the bills. Um, mm. And so you're trying to balance a lot of the time writing the stuff that you want to write, but making sure you don't neglect the people that are paying for the advertising space. So a lot of, a lot of like the regular job is kind of meetings. How can we work with brands? How can we create stuff for them to bring money into the magazine? It's, you've got to be, I guess, going back to, you've got to be creative, but a really good asset as well is developing like a bit of a business mind as well thinking about ways of, I think if you can combine those two, then that'll get recognised in the business. So, yes, yeah, juggling writing and keeping lots of people happy. <laughs> um, yeah, again, I think it's changed a little bit at the minute being in lockdown because we don't get to do all the really fun things like the shoots and stuff at the moment. Hopefully that'll be changing a little bit in the next few months as everything eases up. Day to day for me really will be working on layouts and designing layouts um which is my favorite thing to do so that we'd get say like a word document of copy which the writers do we discuss all the visual imagery what we're going to produce or what we're going to buy in for the layout and then it's just a matter of putting it all together and doing typography and illustration and stuff like that to make it the layout that you see in the magazine that was my main part of my job alongside all that it'd be attending meetings yeah going on photo shoots and working on special projects because for Cosmo like the sex education thing we do a lot of extra bits on the side so it's just juggling all of that really um how has your magazine had to adapt to the social media age um they've got me <laughs> <laughs> I was the first social media manager for my brand and they didn't see it as something that needed to happen. They're like, why do we need this extra person to make us more social? But then when I came, obviously, putting stuff out on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, Pinterest, I think that's it. Um, it's obviously grown the magazine and grown the presence because we've got a following there and people want to sort of engage with it. It goes back to the question I think Wisdom asks, where it's like how what's the future of journalism? And that is part of it. The future is being social and giving the brand a voice where you're directly speaking to people who read the magazine. So it feels more accessible rather than this distant luxury thing that you can't, you can't reach. So that has definitely sort of had to happen for us to make it more relatable for the audience and basically speak to them. So we can get a message from someone who's like, oh, I really want to read something like this in the magazine. And then I would take it to the team and be like, oh, people are asking for content relating to, I don't know how to get bigger arms. And then that then gets inspired, that then inspires a piece in the magazine and then someone writes it. So it's created a whole new um, flow chart where ideas are coming from. Yeah, yeah, def I think like, kind of exactly like what Joyce said is that the, your Instagram your Instagram page is like the first thing that people see. So like if people look, you know, you have to go to a shop and buy Men's Health or Esquire, but you can just follow the Instagram account. So you have to make sure that like those are taken care of. Um, and also now it's changing a lot where like people are starting podcasts. We've been doing some YouTube st style tutorials, little things on Instagram Live. It's just, you, you've got to be very adaptable. So I think that's it. It's, now it's, you can't just have a magazine. You have to have everything something else. that ties everything together. It's like a brand. It's not just a magazine. So, yeah, I think having – and it's good. You know, if you can go in for a job with a social media following, it does make a big difference. I don't. I have a very low <laughs> following. <laughs> but, um, I would say, yeah, it, it, maybe it's a bad thing, but definitely if you're going into an interview and you've got 10,000 Instagram followers and 10,000 Twitter followers, that might be the difference between you getting a job and someone else getting one which is, I don't know, it's just the way it is, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, it, it's really important. Very.
Yeah, I think it's changed. Um, I've seen it change as well. I feel like when I joined as work experience, there was only two digital members and it was just on a website. There was no Instagram. Well, I think Instagram was around, but we weren't on Instagram. We weren't on Twitter really or doing anything. And then over the years, they've now got like 10, 15 digital people on Cosmopolitan. And we now all, it's no longer print and digital. We've like merged together and we're very collaborative and print people get to dabble on digital and digital gets to dabble on print, which is really cool. Cause like Joy said, the idea is it's like a circle of, oh, this could be really good for the magazine. That could be really good for digital. It'll work on both. And it's, yeah, more about just building the whole brand. So it means you're more visible to a much larger audience ultimately because you've got yeah the internet <laughs> and then the actual thing in the shops and I think you've covered this somewhat already but what path did you have to take to get to the job you are in now um experience that's the one thing everybody asks for but it's not the easiest thing to have so I went to uni, I studied for three years and then graduated and then started interning. So just before I graduated from uni, I started interning at magazines and publishing houses and then took a break, had kids and then went back in again. And it's just about exactly who you know. So when I decided that, okay, I'm ready to go back into this industry and do this, just emailed a few of the contacts that I made from intern and being like, oh, I'm looking for my next opportunity. If you know anything, any opening, just let me know. And then a lot of it was referrals. So, oh, my friend on this brand is looking for someone here. Or I can tell you, like, I can, like, freelancing as well. So I had a blog as well. So going all over the place. A blog is very important. It's, it's what you can use to show your work when you have more experience. So once you had that, once I had that um, sorted, I sort of sent it around and be like, okay, if you're looking for example of my writing or what I'm capable of, then here you go. Here's sort of my, portfolio that you can have a look at so that's sort of the path I used I used at uni set up my blog intern and then ended up here somehow <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah mine was kind of I sort of said yes to go to a drinks thing and it kind of led to I was doing work experience at Esquire so I was like about 22 uh and I did work experience for a month and it was my last day it was a Friday and I got invited to go to like an after works like drinks thing and I was like, I really don't want to go. Like I don't really know these people. I just want to go home. And I thought, do you know what? I'll just go. I'll, why not? Like it's my last day. And I ended up getting introduced to the deputy editor of L at the time. Uh, as a woman called Lottie Jeffs. And we got chatting and she just said, Oh, what are you doing on Monday? And I was like, I have no plans, like mm -hmm. I'm out. And she just said, Oh, do you just fancy like coming in and just doing a bit of like work for Elle, like just see how it goes. And I'd never written for a women's magazine, but I guess it goes back to the thing of just like, sometimes you just got to say yes to stuff and say, let's work it out. <laughs> and it's a disaster, like that's the, what's the worst that could happen? Um, and then through doing that, I managed to then get back in when a job opened up at Esquire. So I'd say if you get asked to go to something, like we've talked about before, like networking, say yes, even if you really don't want to go. <laughs> <laughs> um for me i did actually go to uni initially to do graphics and communication design but i wasn't really enjoying the course um it was very academic and like i say i knew i wanted magazines and that wasn't quite working so i opted to do a year in industry and it was part of my course you had to complete nine months work experience I made a CV that looked like a cover and uh, uh, for each magazine I applied to, I changed the logo to their logo and like sent it off to a million and one different magazines. And I only heard back from two at the time, but luckily that was Cosmopolitan and GQ. So I managed to secure two one month work placements with them. Um, obviously I'm from Yorkshire, so coming down to London was absolutely terrifying for me at the time. I was like 19. Um, my family was terrified, like, where do I live, all this? Um, but I did a little Airbnb for a month. And then with my dad, the day before, we went to the little recce of, right, here's how you get the tube and how you get to the office on your first day. <laughs> it took us two hours 
from Oxford Street tube station down to what should have been a 10 minute walk. It took us two <laughs> hours to find it. I was petrified, but <laughs> by the next day it was fine, we'd planned it. I'm glad we did that the day before. But then it was just a matter of, I sat next to an art director for my full time on work experience at Cosmo and she, and I told her I needed to fill the nine months and she knew the art director on Glamour and they were looking for an art intern. But, so it was like, perfect. She recommended me to him. And then I got to do a full eight month internship with them. I was then meant to go back to uni at the end of the year. And then I got a call one day, a couple of weeks actually before I was meant to go back to Leeds Uni from the creative director of Cosmo saying, would you like to be the junior designer? And I was like, uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, and then dropped out of uni at the time because he, he reassured me and my family I was so young I was 20 like that a degree isn't important it's the potential and what you're going to be able to do in the industry that's important so it's definitely who you know and I've been there and worked up ever since <laughs> that's all my questions thank you that was really interesting thank you Thank you, everyone. That was it was so interesting. Real insight to everyone. And thank, well done, Wisdom and Jessica, for coming up with those questions. Um, so there are other students here in this um, virtual room. So if anyone else has got any questions, then feel free to, you know, jot them down in the chat. Oh, here you go. So we've got one already. That's good. Get, get them rolling in. Okay, so this is a... In, interesting one okay so who's the nicest celebrity you've ever met are you allowed to say <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> you got so they're throwing names at us <laughs> sure i'll go I'll, <laughs> I'll flip it my first my second day at l i had to interview kate winslet uh <laughs> and she was very scary but she was nice um, if someone can be scary and nice at the same time, uh, <laughs> she's definitely the most memorable. So. Well, she said because you were intimidated by her, though. Yeah, because I didn't really know how it worked. But a lot of the time, if you go and interview a celebrity, you'll have like 10 minutes or sometimes even less. You'll, mm -hmm. I know someone that interviewed David Beckham, but he got a minute. Uh, <laughs> it's really like, so you sit down and they've got all the lights, they've got like 30 people around them. They're, a lot of these celebrities they've got like a bit of an aura around them and but she's scary like if you ask her something she'll like zone in on you and you feel pretty seen <laughs> <laughs> Jaden smith was nice as well i liked him um the first sort of publishing job i had uh we lost a cover start and they're like oh we've got this opportunity to and it sounded like I had just one X Factor, and they're like, Oh, do you want to interview her? And I was like, I've never, ever, ever done an interview like that. And they're just like, Just do it. I was like, Okay. And I was on the phone with her, and I, I remember I pronounced something wrong, and she sort of corrected me, and I was like, Oh, <laughs> and I sort of went back to my throat immediately. I was like, I'm not asking her any questions anymore. I was just like, Just let her talk and then write a story based on what she says. But yeah. Um. Mine are actually, I think the nicest people are actually a little mix. Um, I've met them a few times now. They're just like so down to earth. I think because we're a similar age. Uh, when I first met them when I was an intern and I was so nervous then, I was like, oh my gosh, they are amazing. Um, but they were just so down to earth and so normal. It was like hanging with your friends. And then I've um, we shot them actually quite recently for the cover and now I... I'm art editor and they remembered me from like six years prior and the amount of people they must meet in the industry I was just like even then I was a bit of a fangirl over it like oh that's so nice you meet so many people <laughs> <laughs> so I think they were lovely so glamorous what glamorous jobs Janet and I don't get to meet celebrities do we <laughs> <laughs> um, so any any more questions while we've got everyone here? 
I mean, you can you can turn your mic off. Is it, which one were you about to ask something? You turned your mic off. Or was that a mistake? <laughs> um, yeah, no, because Jessica was talking about Little Mix. I actually wanted to say that I met Little Mix. Um, I met Jade from Little Mix last week in Canary Wharf, and I got like really excited. <laughs> oh, she's so lovely. I know. <laughs> and I actually got a picture with her. Oh, I love that. That's so cute. Yeah. Um, I did have one question. This is a bit of a weird one. But if you had to give advice to your younger self, what would it be? Don't care about what people think. Just do you. That is so important. Because you, like um, Finley said, you go into the industry and you start comparing yourself with like people who maybe you studied with or you interned with. And you're like, oh, my God, that person now an editor. Oh, my God, that person now a director. And you're like, oh, God. You put yourself under so much pressure. Let it all go and just focus on your own lane and just, Keep going straight on your own side. Don't look, don't look left, don't look right. Yeah. That's the advice I give my younger self, yeah. <laughs> yeah, definitely. I think, I think it's just like, like I said, a lot of the time it, you, you can think, oh, how do I do that? And a lot of it's just asking the question. I'd say it's like be positive about, again, like letting go of that fear of rejection. It's like being polite, but also being confident enough that, like, even before I started doing this, I got a few interviews just by like being like, can I talk to you? Like, I, I'm writing a story. Almost, if you want to be a journalist, almost sounds ridiculous, but like treat yourself like you are a journalist already. Like you've got lots to learn, but like call people up and say, I'm writing a story about this. And it doesn't matter if you've got a magazine or not. I still had a few people agree to speak to me. And it's just getting yourself into that mindset, I think, is really important. Yeah. And I think just take every opportunity that you get, even if it terrifies you and you're incredibly nervous to take it on board because it'll be so worth it I think my younger self was very nervous at the time and didn't always say yes to everything and I was like oh you should have done that it would have been amazing so now I do everything pretty much and oh, it, even if I'm terrified even now it just makes such a difference and I'm like I'm so glad I did that <laughs> look who I met out of that so always take everything cool. Um, okay, so we've got another another. Well, there's a couple of questions here. So, um, if you could create an ideal cover, what would you cover? I don't know. So I think typically, I guess. Is that maybe Jessica? Is this more you? Yeah. yeah. Um. Oh, I'd love to put a non-celebrity on the cover. Um, kind of actually how the men's health did, you know, how Joy mentioned how men's health did all these school children. I thought that was just absolutely incredible. I would love to do something like that with young women from all over the country, whether it was like a group of young women on the cover or we did loads of individual ones and it was like a collector's edition. I think that'd be amazing. You could have, have the students from Candy. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I think did Vogue do was it Vogue that did one recently but they had like healthcare workers as like yeah yeah yeah, yeah that was really, that was really I, good. I really like that. that yeah that was amazing cool and then so um same students asking uh, were there any challenges that you faced that made you want to leave the industry and how did you deal with that challenge or hardship oh that's a that's a tough question that's really I tough. have cried in many toilets in the workplace <laughs> <laughs> um, it gets a bit frustrating like um, Finley said it gets a bit you have to take constructive criticism and you have to not take it personally you have to understand that it's not you it's just this is what the brand represents and your idea has to mould into what the brand is so when someone says no based on something that you've created it's not them judging your creativity or you as a person it's just them judging that I think based on how it fits with that brand. But it takes a while to sort of build that knowledge and that confidence. So yeah, I've cried a few times where my work has just openly been criticized and you're like, oh, okay. I thought I was going well, but clearly you not. Know. <laughs> <laughs> and um, sadly, I have experienced racism in the workplace because that's just the industry. When you're the only other in the room, you tend to not be seen or your voice is not heard as much as it should be. So you do feel like the finest person in the space that you're in, but you get over it. You just, the more you experience, the more you're just like, you know what, 
I'm just going to keep on proving you wrong. Don't be a statistic. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think I think I had a few moments when I first started. I had a few moments when I was probably about 22, 23, and I was at Esquire, but I was junior, and I got a few job interviews approached to me for a few different other other jobs, and they weren't quite in general. I got like asked to do something for like a kind of lifestyle brand and then another for like an online shopping kind of platform that also had and it was for more money and i was really close to taking them but i think that we're sort of talking about before is that a lot of the time the money's not that great but you have to think what do you want to do every day because you can be tempted by like a bit of a pay rise but also i think it's important to have a bit of patience if you're young there's time to develop your skills and so then you'll get like you there, there are opportunities there I think sometimes there's that temptation to be like, oh, that's a bit more money, I'll take it. But are you going to improve and are you going to be taught a lot? And I think those first three or four years that you're, if you want to be a journalist, that's it's really crucial that you're pushed, that you're given lots of like con constructive feedback. And I think sometimes there's a temptation to be like, I'll take the, I'll take the easy job. I'll take the, the one that's just going to, that looks nice. But I think you've got to know yourself well enough to know where do I want to be in 10 years time? And to have a bit of patience, it will all happen. Um, I think for me, it, it, it was sometimes it's kind of hard being quite a young woman in a, with an authoritative role, because if I've ever been on shoots and stuff in the past with male older photographers, they often, would look down on me or not want to take my opinion on board because I'm not seen as someone who they respect or they don't know my career history or anything like that. And initially that would, like, even when I was a junior designer, our boss was really good at sending us all on shoots and being the director of that shoot at the time. So even as a junior, I was able to do those opportunities, but I didn't feel like I could do the direction because I felt quite patronised or like, oh, I shouldn't be saying this. But then he reminded me at the time, he was like, no, on the day you are the boss. It doesn't matter what your role is, it doesn't matter how old you are, you can you could do it, you could tell them what you want. So I just started to get braver and feel more confident in myself. And now if anyone even tries to like, make a comment like oh how old are you or how long have you been doing it I'm like that's that doesn't matter I'm here to like tell you what to do <laughs> <laughs> so listen to me <laughs> and um yeah just be brave and confident in yourself I think brilliant that's that's a nice kind of sentence to leave on be brave and confident in yourself <laughs> that's, so, that's so, so amazing thank you everyone it's been um really really insightful so i hope the students have enjoyed it um and um, hope you've learned a lot just i think again like just the the amount of times that all of you mentioned about sort of like networking really and just kind of like you know saying yes to everything um that's my problem in my job i'm not very good at saying no so but if uh, <laughs> that's janet's laughing <laughs> because you see opportunities and you think oh wow that'd be so amazing and it's just that's the attitude i think isn't it that you've got to have and just kind of you know, you never know where something is going to lead. So, yeah, so thank you, everyone. Students, if you want to know any other questions at all, I'm sure if you think of something after this, I'm sure that everyone here will be more than happy to answer any individual questions. So just send them through to me. A massive thank you to Wisdom and Jessica again, because I know you're both so busy and you took the time to kind of put those questions together. So thank you very much. So. If I could just ask the panellists just to stay on the call for just um, just for two seconds afterwards, but I will say goodbye to the students now. Thank you very much, students. Thanks, <laughs> Bye. 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 Bye.